Hi, welcome to the COVID-19 Lake Norman and North Mecklenburg briefing call. Today is Wednesday, May the 6th, 2020. Uh, my name is John Bradford and I am your briefing call moderator. I'm a small business owner. I have two businesses uh, with about 40 total employees right here in North Mecklenburg in the Lake Norman area. And I'm a former member of the North Carolina House of Representatives. The purpose of these calls is to bring together healthcare experts, government officials, and business leaders to provide regular COVID-19 briefings to update, educate, and support the North Mecklenburg region during the outbreak. Uh, the CDC has guidance for cleaning and disinfecting. The reason I keep showing this every call is because uh, some businesses are starting to open and they need to uh, basically develop a plan, implement a plan, and maintain and revise a plan. And this is a great document for making sure you're doing the right things to clean and disinfect public spaces, workplaces, businesses, schools, and homes. Uh, the latest uh, numbers from the CDC were about 1,170,000 cases uh, here in uh, the U.S. with about 68,000 deaths. And as you can see from the heat map here, uh, North Carolina, uh, we're definitely not uh, the, any of the top hot spots. Uh, we're probably somewhere you know, in the middle based on the, uh, the color chart here uh, before you. There is a great website for rumors. It's the FEMA rumor control website. Uh, there are no new rumors to share with you today. I've always shared any rumor that's new. Uh, there's a whole list of rumors that you can access from the FEMA site. Uh, the most important thing here, folks, is do not be scammed. No one is going to give you money. No one has your uh, stimulus check money. The IRS or the Treasury will send that to you directly. So please do not be scammed. Uh, there uh, is some helpful information here. North Carolina is still under a state of emergency. And in terms of our numbers, they, this data just came in on May the uh, 6th, which is today at 1045. We're at 12,758 cases with 477 deaths here in North Carolina. Comparing that to our last call, which was Monday, uh, we had 430 deaths. So the death count has crept up just a little bit. And the hospitalization number went from 498 to 516, and we're still sitting at 99 counties out of 100 impacted. There's one, one county left out of the 100. It's the last county, although I suspect before it's over, we'll have 100 out of 100. Um, the, North, uh, the North Carolina Pandemic Response Act, this bill was ratified by the North Carolina governor. Uh, it's a $1.57 billion bill. Uh, it includes money for education, healthcare, food banks, coronavirus testing, contact tracing, tracking, PPE, and more. And we're joined, and we'll be joined today by the Speaker of the House who might cover this in more detail. Uh, the big news is uh, phase one is an, has been announced. We'll start this Friday at 5 p.m. Now, North Carolina is still under a stay-at-home executive order. Uh, so just so you know, uh, we are still under um, a uh, executive order here. So, um, uh, we will keep pushing on uh, as we can, but let me go through some of the distinctions uh, about this phase one. Uh, it will start uh, 5 p.m. May 8th, and it will end May 22nd at 5 p.m. Uh, it's going to eliminate the distinction between essential and non-essential businesses. So now there's, there's really no distinction between the two. It's gonna allow any business to open as long as it limits capacity to 50%, as long as you screen workers for symptoms, and you enforce social distancing and following enhanced cleaning rules. Now, there are specific types of businesses that must remain closed. We're gonna cover those in a moment. Uh, it does expand the reasons that people are allowed to leave home so they can visit any business that's open. But remember, we're still under a stay-at-home executive order through all of phase one. Mass gatherings remain limited at 10 people and large group gatherings are still prohibited, but small get-togethers outside, and outside is the important thing to follow here, is uh, okay, as long as you still do not have more than 10 people and that you're following the recommendations to promote social distancing. Now, all this said, let's go through some of the, what I would call important things to understand about phase one. So what stays the same and remains unchanged in phase one? This would be, you know, what basically doesn't change from today that's going to change on Friday. So these are the things that remain unchanged. The, stay at, the statewide stay-at-home order still remains in place all the way until phase two. So we're still at a stay-at-home order. Mass gatherings are still limited to no more than 10 people. Teleworking remains encouraged. Social distancing, hand hygiene, and other methods uh, should be practiced, including staying six feet apart. People may leave their homes to obtain medical services, obtain goods and services, engage in outdoor exercise, take care of other volunteers, 
playgrounds are going to remain closed. Uh, and uh, open retail businesses must meet certain requirements to ensure safety of their employees and customers. And visitation continues to be banned at long-term care facilities, except for certain compassionate care situations. Uh, so typically hospice is what that means. Now, what businesses must remain closed in phase one? So this is important. These are the types of businesses that have to remain closed. Restaurants for dine-in services must remain closed, but they can provide drive-through, takeout, and delivery. So the in-store in or in-restaurant dining is still closed, but you can do, still do the drive-through, takeout, delivery. That's, that's exactly what we've been experiencing already. Personal care and grooming businesses like barber shops, hair salons, and nail salons, they must remain closed in phase one. Health clubs, fitness centers, gyms, and other indoor exercise facilities remain closed, including yoga studios, martial arts facilities, indoor trampoline, and rock climbing facilities. And then entertainment facilities must remain closed, including any performance venues, movie theaters, bowling alleys, and indoor and outdoor pools. I've had lots of questions about community pools. They must remain closed during phase one. Now, what does phase one mean for camps? We have the summer upon us, and so there's lots of camps. Day camps and programs for children and teens may operate only if they're in full compliance with the CDC's guidelines. Day camps may not allow for sports except for those sports where close contact is not required. And any activities where campers cannot maintain at least six feet distance from one another are also not allowed. If a day camp is operating within a business, facility, or school that is closed per this executive order, the camp may operate, but the location must otherwise remain closed to the general public. So think of the camp inside could be open, but the actual rest of it would be closed. And overnight camps are not uh, permissible under phase one. So these would be day camps only, all right? Another one is what about, what does phase one mean for people who wanna stay at hotels or other short-term vacation rentals? You know, does this allow for you to stay at these hotels and short-term rentals? And the answer is yes. Hotels and short-term vacation rentals are allowed. However, individuals should practice stay at home uh, and other recommendations to promote social distancing and reduce transmission and other measures at a short-term rental. And then rental landlords should follow the CDC guidelines on cleaning hotels and your rental units, including any EPA approved disinfectant between customers. So, you know, this is important information for, for those that are using hotels or want to stay at hotels or take advantage of a short-term vacation rental. Does phase one require North Carolinians to wear masks when outside the home? Well, the answer is no. It's strongly recommended, but it is not required. And this is about the face, the cloth face coverings that cover your nose and mouth. And it's recommended that you should wear these when you leave your house and are within six feet of other people who are not household and family members. This does include uh, indoor community, public, and business settings. Uh, just remember, these coverings function to protect other people even more than the person that's wearing them. So the mask is there to really protect the transmission of this particular virus. So it protects from the transmission uh, as much or even more than the person that's actually wearing the mask, which is why it's important if you can wear a mask or a face covering, you should. And face coverings is recommended to be worn outdoors when you cannot stay at least six feet away from other people. Now, what does phase one mean for schools and graduations? School facilities remain closed for in-person instruction for the remainder of the year. Nothing's changed with that. In terms of uh, uh, graduation, uh, the governor and his team is leaving that up to local school boards and superintendents on how they're gonna conduct graduation or other year-end ceremonies. Uh, we heard from last call that there's a task force at CMS, and I don't have any news for you there, but just wanted to cover that since we have so many seniors that are looking to graduate. And what does phase one mean for childcare? Child care facilities will be open for children of North Carolinians who are working at a business that is not, that is not closed by this phase one executive order who are maybe seeking employment or who are homeless and are receiving child welfare services. And then of course, child care facilities must follow the safety requirements back in executive order 130 and all the guidelines issued by the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. And then what does one mean for places of worship? We get that question quite a bit. Places of worship may hold services that exceed the mass gathering limit of 10 people. I just got to... Services are held outdoors and in closed space. That... And if attendees follow recommendations to fo promote social distancing. So places of worship can hold mass gatherings outdoors if there's enough space and you practice social uh, distancing.
phase two is going to start tentatively on May 22nd that's from Friday. And then phase three will follow approximately four to six weeks after that. Now the three W's that's been, you talked about, wear a face covering, wash your hands, wait six feet apart from other people to keep your distance. And then because we're talking about face coverings, I always cover this, Indira Mills, shop.indiramills.com. They have youth face covering masks available. They have regular face uh, coverings available, $2 a mask, 12 dozen minimum order. Um, and uh, you know, here's the, here's the information to call it and order. Uh, Mecklenburg County data, and then we'll get to our panelists. They have 1,787 positive cases with 57 deaths. Three and four reported cases were adults 20 to 59. One in six reported cases were hospitalized due to the infection. And two and three reported cases have met CDC criteria to be released from isolation. And it's important that during the past week, we have seen some decreases in laboratory confirmed infections, as well as um, just the number of individuals who are tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, we've seen a, a, a slight decrease over the last 14 days. So uh, that's probably why we are now moving towards phase one. And lastly, in North Mecklenburg, as you can see, Huntersville and Cornelius have somewhere, it looks like between 50 to 69 cases with Davidson's between five to 24. Now, we uh, are hopefully joined today by the Speaker of the House, Tim Moore. Uh, I invited him to the call. He's, of course, the Speaker of the House. He's from District 111, Cleveland County. They just uh, an important bill. Uh, uh, Speaker Moore, are you with us today? I'm with you, John. How are you, sir? I'm great, sir. We'd love to hear from you about the, the, the good work you just passed, the $1.6 billion bill, and love to get your thoughts on the reopening plan. Well, of course, we're very proud of the uh, legislation that we passed this week, uh, or last week, rather, for the $1.6 billion that's going to be targeted to everything from helping stabilize hospitals to getting personal protective equipment there to, to funding the educational needs to... Uh, uh, to resolving the, the government operations matters, the red reform. We had a lot of really good, solid work uh, that went into that. Everything from, you know, of course, spending the money, but uh, delaying taxes, making sure that unemployment's being paid, uh, extending various things like licensure, everything from your driver's license to business permits and licensing. Really just, uh, it was a very, very uh, significant and huge piece of legislation that addressed all sorts of issues, and and I and I'm very proud of the fact that it uh, it actually things were bipartisan on this one, which is something that uh, we'd not had in a while. Uh, but uh, this one was actually uh, entirely unanimous, and uh, we appointed four ta I appointed four task forces to deal with this for a period of about six weeks. They they did a lot of work. All the meetings were done remotely. Uh, got a lot of great ideas. Found out where a lot of the pressure points were and took that information and put that into something that uh, really was a, was a consensus item. Uh, that, that now has been done. So you know, we're, we've got that out there, we've got those resources there. We've got money in terms of the loan funds out there for small business. I mean, there's just, you know, when it's $1.6 billion, you can talk for more than a few minutes about all the things that are there, but suffice it to say, uh, we've covered everything from A to Z to make sure we're funding those critical needs. Uh, you were talking about the, the governor's uh, where we are in terms of the shutdown right now. We have uh, also, I've, I've sent a letter to the HHS secretary asking for more data to be shared. I think it's very, very important that that be out there, that we know that the decisions that are being made right now in terms of the uh, government operations and, and the uh, economic activities that have been slowed down, that they make sense. Uh, that, that, that while you know, we need to restrict things there needs to be a balance between the health of, of people and the health of the economy, as well as, you know, some of the things where we're shutting some things down are causing other health issues. And so we need to be looking at that. We need to be looking at the data. We need to make sure that, um, that we're seeing what we need to see. The good news is, is that all of the models that we're showing, you know, the thousands and thousands of deaths for North Carolinians simply uh, were, not right, were not correct. In fact, in most areas of the country, the uh, models that came in early on have, uh, fortunately and thankfully, uh, it, we're, 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 we're overshooting. We're indicating there is going to be much more in sense of, of, uh, of deaths and hospitalizations than there have been. And there's a number of reasons that the data is showing that it's not been as bad as, as it was feared. But uh, suffice it to say that it's, uh, we've, you know, we've got to find a way to safely, and I want to stress that, safely 
and in a matter phase in our economy, resuming uh, getting things back as much as normal as possible. But again, there's going to have to be safeguards in place to make sure that we're all we're all safe and that we you know, don't have a second round of this thing. So uh, there's there is some difference of opinion developing out there on that. It's my hope that we can continue to resolve this collaboratively and and avoid things there. But look look at what our neighboring states are doing. Look at what South Carolina is doing. Look at what Tennessee is doing. Uh, these are states that are moving uh, moving uh, more robustly than North Carolina. In fact, if you if we stay on the track we're on right now in terms of the reopening, there's only six other states that are with North Carolina and they're all in, in New England and the north for the most part the northern part of the country and they've all had much more serious um, cases of COVID-19. So I think that what we need to be doing is based on the data we have needs to be common sense needs to be very measured and and we need to start going in that direction and additionally John uh, you are in a very beautiful part of the uh, state there northern Mecklenburg County and uh, Mecklenburg County is certainly the the engine to uh, in a lot of ways to what goes on in North Carolina but you know not all 100 counties are Mecklenburg County and we have a lot of counties in the state that are much more rural much more sparsely populated and where the occurrence rate uh, in real numbers and in per capita numbers is very very small and so I do think that the governor should take a more nuanced approach to this and really look at um, you know, looking at things, uh, allowing the counties some flexibility, uh, you know, assuming that certain metrics are, are measured and are met. And so that can be done. And so those are some of the uh, some of the items that we're going to be pushing uh, in, in our discussions in the next uh, couple of weeks. And of course, we'll be back in session on the 18th. And of course, we have some various pieces of legislation we'll be considering and uh, we'll we're hopeful again to continue the collaboration, but we're also uh, make, making certain that the uh, uh, that the folks back home and all the counties around the state are that their voices are heard as well. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. Thanks for your good work and your leadership. It's much appreciated. And uh, you know, after you know leading these calls, there is no doubt that phase two, which is where the stay-at-home order is lifted, is really where we need to get to quickly. So I, I know it's May twenty-second, but hopefully we can maybe even get there sooner. I guess time will tell. Thanks for joining. We, pre we appreciate you, sir. Hey. Thanks for having me on. I hope you and uh, all your listeners uh, stay stay healthy and stay well. And uh, glad to, glad to get back to work here. Take care. Thank you so much. You bet. Now we're going to move to. Uh, we're very lucky to have every Wednesday we have uh, our North Carolina uh, director Thomas A. Stith III with the United States Small Business Administration. Uh, uh, director Stith, the uh, microphone's yours, sir. Uh, John, thank you again, and as always, thank you for your leadership in providing this forum to um, information be disseminated to folks in uh, the Mecklenburg area. I uh, wanted to give just two updates, one around the Paycheck Protection Program and then one uh, in, in respect to the Economic Injury Disaster Loans. Um, as you know, we had additional funding uh, for both the Paycheck Protection Program and Economic Injury Disaster Loan. Uh, as of close of business on yesterday, with the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, 2.3 million loans across the country had been approved. Uh, that's a little over $181 billion. Um, we're seeing average loan size below $80,000, around $69,000 to $70,000. Uh, this was in comparison to the first round funding where the average loan was $206,000. So. There was a concerted effort, not only within the legislation to ensure a broader base of small businesses had access to this capital, and the numbers are bearing out that we are seeing broader participation and a significantly amount, numbers of loans, to double what we received in the last round with $349 billion um, have already been approved. Now, importantly, uh, there is still funding available for the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, well over $100 billion still available. Uh, we are actually um, holding an, a, a webinar on tomorrow with the district office uh, to inform small businesses, nonprofits, uh, faith-based organizations that there is still availability. Um, and so we're encouraging uh, maybe those businesses that had not pursued in the first or during the second round to 
review and to see if the Paycheck Protection Program is something that will be benefit to their business. Already combined with the first and second round, North Carolina businesses have been approved for over $12 billion. Uh, over 80,000 businesses have, and not, uh, faith based and uh, nonprofits have been approved. Uh, so, a significant uh, impact of financial support already. Obviously, there continues to be a, a significant need. And so, we encourage uh, small businesses and nonprofits. Uh, to uh, approach their uh, local lenders, either banks or credit unions, uh, to um, assess whether they may be interested in pursuing the Paycheck Protection Program. And as we've said before, uh, it has a forgivable clause. So if proceeds are utilized at least 75% for payroll during that eight weeks following receipt of funds, you can actually use up to 25% for utilities, rent or lease payments, uh, that that combined expenditure uh, that takes place after the eight weeks of receiving funds will be forgiven. So your loan could be significantly reduced and in some instances fully forgiven uh, if, if utilized for those allowable uses. So again, just encouraging uh, small businesses, nonprofits uh, to, to take a, um, a very serious review and look at the Paycheck Protection Program. The other initiative is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. And this week that was opened up for new applicants that are part of the agribusiness community. Uh, in the second round of funding, uh, ag agricultural businesses were designated as eligible for Economic Injury Disaster Loans. Uh, and so the portal, um, and those are loans direct with SBA, uh, those businesses that uh, qualify those uh, in general are agriculture businesses with less than 500 employees um, should, are encouraged to apply for the economic injury disaster loans. Uh, existing loans that were submitted uh, before the portal was uh, closed because of limited funding are currently being reviewed and uh, processed. Uh, so those are, are, are still in process. Um, and, and as I mentioned, the, the agriculture businesses now are eligible uh, to submit uh, uh, applications. Uh, there was an additional $60 billion uh, appropriated for economic injury disaster loans in this second round of funding, $50 billion for economic injury disaster loans, uh, full loans, and a, an additional $10 billion for the emergency advance that can be requested up to uh, $10,000. Those uh, typically there will be $1,000 per employee. Uh, so John, uh, very good good news that uh, both the PPP and EIDLs are, are reaching the, their intended audiences, but we recognize that SBA is still a tremendous demand and, and therefore we're encouraging people uh, to continue to look at the Paycheck Protection Program as a, a viable financial um, benefit for their organization. So. Uh, that's the the update for today, and we will we will continue to stay engaged and supportive of our small business community. Wonderful, thank you so much for your leadership, and that was a very very helpful update. It's great to hear that so many North Carolina businesses have been able to you know to receive the help, so we can continue to protect uh, jobs, which is very important. So thank you for your time, and uh, look forward to chatting with you next Wednesday. Moving to Dr. J Faircloth now with Atrium Health One. Uh, Dr. Faircloth, a medical doctor on the ground right here uh, in North Mac uh, Huntersville. Uh, Dr. Jack, the microphone's yours, sir. Okay, thanks, John, and thanks to the panel for putting this on. You guys have helped us greatly, and I hope we're being of some service. Uh, I think patients uh, in the community want to know what's going on in our healthcare facilities as far as our numbers and deaths. So I'll start there. Uh, we've recently seen a flattening of the new diagnoses at our testing sites. We've seen a flattening of the admissions to the hospitals for COVID-19. And uh, interestingly, we've seen admissions for non-COVID-19 related illnesses uh, start to increase in our hospitals again. So that is a, a strange way of uh, showing signs that people are uh, trusting and feeling uh, safer to, to uh, access healthcare again. Um, we did unfortunately have two new deaths in Mecklenburg County lately, so that brings uh, the total of corona, uh, coronavirus deaths to 57, according to the health department. As of Sunday, 
uh, over half of the deaths in Mecklen Mecklenburg County were in long-term care facilities. So we are uh, seeing them as the most vulnerable population. And uh, we're seeing people not in long-term care facilities still have a very low uh, chance of fatality, uh, but a real chance. Um, the good news about healthcare is we're seeing more people in person in clinics now, and um, that that is good for our overall non-COVID issues. Um, hospitals in Mecklenburg uh, counties began to open up for elective surgeries two days ago on Monday. Uh, there's a protocol for testing the patient and testing the um, providers that will be um, uh, contacting the patient, and we've already found uh, one provider with COVID-19 asymptomatically and had to cancel the surgery. We've also found uh, patients that have had the disease and have their uh, elective surgery canceled. So that's for certain elective surgeries. Uh, updates on the treatments and or vaccines. Um, we have a, a brand new stem cell therapy trial. It's uh, out from a company called Mesoblast and they've moved from phase one uh, trial to phase two because they did show positive results treating people severely uh, affected by COVID-19 in the hospital. So that moves on to a further study. Uh, the antiviral medicine Resdemivir, which is from the company Gilead, uh, is being studied locally in our hospitals. It's being given compassionately around the world, and it has uh, recently been boosted uh, by some uh, data that says it shrinks the time that uh, those fighting a severe uh, COVID-19 illness um, uh, have to be hospitalized. So that is a, that looks like a positive uh, break on a treatment. No updates in vaccines. Uh, lots of companies, we said there's uh, 92 trials uh, in the, my previous talk uh, for vaccines. So there's a lot of promise there, but the technology is brand new uh, for DNA vaccines and RNA vaccines. So we are remaining uh, cautiously optimistic for vaccines. Um, antibody testing. This uh, is the type of test that's done on blood and shows not if you are currently infected, but have you been affected, uh, infected with COVID-19. And this is, uh, this testing for antibodies took a giant step forward this week. Uh, the Roche uh, laboratory company uh, show, uh, has now an FDA approved antibody test that has near 100% accuracy. Uh, this test is not a finger prick uh, test, not a nasal swab. It's a test done on uh, a tube of blood taken from a vein, which is the typical standard way of taking blood in the, in the doctor's office. And it will be a prescription uh, test to be done in our labs. Timing of this test, uh, their, their company's projected two weeks to start to have the, the um, antibody test available. And they said they can scale to high double digit millions is their quote in a month. So we'll see what happens there. Um, just in closing, I would like to echo the sentiment so far that we're not out of the woods yet. Um, Georgia is uh, watching a new hot spot in the northeast uh, Georgia area of Gainesville. They're actually building a mobile hospital there as we speak, so they've seen increased numbers over five weeks. Um, Iowa had its highest death uh, rate, death total yesterday at 19. These are two of the states that have begun reopening, so measured and safe reopening and, and slow unfortunately, is, is a rule. I do want to echo the uh, North Carolina.gov um, uh, website's um, uh, advice to remember your Ws. I do agree with the wearing a face mask being the first W, uh, waiting when you're in public uh, six feet apart, avoiding close contact in all scenarios, and then the third W of washing your hands often or using hand sanitizer. Um, I, do, I do think that's great advice for our families. Uh, we do have to keep our families, our neighbors, ourselves safe. So if we can just remember those three W's. Um, and, and I do want to point people to the, the nc.gov uh, three-phase plan because, like you said earlier, they're, they're very clear specifics and it's not a, not a free-for-all opening and, and it has to be done slow and safe. So thank you for my time. Yeah, you bet, Dr. Jack. Thank you so much for being a regular on our panel here. So. Um, now, and ha on happy Nurses Day to all the folks that uh, work with you. So please uh, spread our thanks for, to all your uh, nurses and colleagues. Uh, moving to uh, Mecklenburg County Commissioner Pat Cotham. Uh, Commissioner Cotham, are you with us today? If so, the microphone's yours. Okay, yes, thank you. And um, I really appreciate all the speakers that we've had so far. We've, and 
we have really have learned a lot today. And John, your your opening was very uh, comprehensive, so thank you for that. Um, I, I kind of just want to be brief, and I want to just talk a little bit more on the human side. I'm not going to cite any uh, numbers. I don't think so. Uh, it, the only number I'll cite is that that the county has spent. Um, close to $12 million so far on the virus. We learned that when we had our meeting uh, last night, um, but I'm sure more information will be forthcoming on that. Um, I did have um, several questions uh, from the last, our last talk about our the aquatic center and our swimming pools at the county. And at this point, uh, they are not going to, they're not open. There's no plans for them to open anytime real soon, but I will keep people posted on that. Um, I, I, I can't remember if I said on the call last Wednesday, last Wednesday about, um, the mask. I, I, I know the importance of masks of wearing a mask, but I am hearing from a lot of people uh, who have, uh, anxiety, or who have um, children or uh, even adult children who have uh, cognitive um, disabilities, whether it was autism or Down syndrome, also that, that uh, wearing a mask is that's something they cannot do. And um, so I, I just ask for people to be uh, sensitive and not judgmental. I've seen and heard comments um, you know, disparaging people who were not wearing masks and not realizing that they could have had some kind of a difficulty that we don't really understand. And so I just ask for patience there. Um, and that kind of also brings me to just overall mental health. Um, the, you know, the impact of social isolation, uh, you know, it, it's hard to clarify exactly what that is. Uh, but it is something that is impactful uh, to families and to Mecklenburg County. And um, one thing that I I haven't heard much from, as much as I would like, is uh, on this funding is to help with mental health, uh, because people are uh, many people are very very stressed, and many children are very stressed. And um, children I have learned to have a uh, learning disabilities or um, that are in special classes at school, uh, they are really struggling and that is harder on families. And so, um, you know, but I, it's just something that I think that we, we need to, and I'm going to, am going to talk to the, um, the county manager about that. And, and my colleagues also have brought it up about uh, mental health. Um, and, you know, I would also say just from my calls that, I'm hearing more from women um, who are also very stressed because they're trying to, you know, they're trying to do their job. They're trying to help with the kids with school and keep the kids busy. And uh, it's, they are just um, at their wits end. I don't know how else to describe it. So I, I do think that, you know, we need to be, you know, really patient with others and not shaming people, but, you know, how can we help? Um, and I, I do worry about our class of 2020 uh, that's not having a, a, their typical graduation. From from, I, I have talked to many graduates, and they keep telling me, you know, they're okay. It's their parents and their grandparents that are really struggling with it. And um, so I thought that was interesting because the kids seem to be, oh, you know, not not suffering too much about it because they can do things on online and they're all tech savvy, but it's the parents and the grandparents uh, that are struggling with the lack of graduations and, you know, those traditional things, whether it's the prom or, or whatever. Um, uh, I am hearing from business owners and who are having trouble getting workers back to work because um, some of them are doing well with the, the the funding that's great that we're getting funding, but they're kind of like you know their business isn't good their uh, their job will be gone if if they don't start coming back to work when the opportunity exists. But I've heard from several business people um, about that, so that's something uh, to think about. I've also heard from landlords who are feeling um, the impact of 
the uh, the uh, ruling that um, people cannot get evicted, and um, many of them are very understanding, uh, but they do feel that some of their tenants do have the means to pay it or just choosing not to. And um, they're, you know, they're having a struggle. I'm going to try to learn more about that in the weeks ahead. And I've asked them to, you know, if I, if they go to court to let me know, but that's something that uh, worries me. And, um, you know, I, you know, sometimes people take advantage of the system and, and that we certainly don't want that. Um, you know, here's another thing that uh, has come, has also touched me personally, um, and I have read some articles about it because I've had some people tell me that their loved ones recently passed away, and they they did not, they were not living here, um, but they the individual was upset that they were listed as a COVID death but they felt strongly the individual, their loved one was not a COVID death. And I read some news articles from around the country, especially in the Northeast, that um, some hospitals were, if they had more COVID deaths, they were eligible for more ventilators. So that gave me pause. And then my sister died last week um, on Thursday. And she was not in a hospital, and she just died in her sleep. My sister had heart problems, and um, but I, in talking to her children, they were very upset that she was listed on her death certificate as a COVID death. My sister lives in St. Louis, and they were trying to get that changed, but were running into difficulties with it. So um, I just ask you to. To, if you hear more about this or anyone tells you, if you would let me know, I'm just because it affected me personally with my sister, and I'm sure she did not have COVID. She had no symptoms of that, uh, but she, my sister Betty did have, you know, some severe heart problems. Uh, so that's something I'm going to be focusing on a little bit. I, I hope that's not happening here. I hope that's not happening anywhere, but I think it, it is. And um you know, we we don't. We also need to be able to trust the the data that we're getting, um, and so those are all things that are murky and um, not um, in anyone's best interest. So uh, that's uh, that's all I have from Mecklenburg County. I think uh, John, you covered a lot of things from Mecklenburg County, and I appreciate that um, on the overall. But I just wanted to give this personal side. And just to remember that um, many people are really feeling stressed and especially parents of kids with special needs who are not eligible, who, who are not getting their therapy. And it's, it's a real struggle. So um, thank you very much. We just all need to keep uh, our, each other in our prayers and um, hopefully we, and we will get through this, uh, whether we're six feet apart <laughs> um, uh, in, as Time goes on. Thank you very much. You bet. And thank you, uh, Commissioner Coughlin. And, and uh, I know I reached out to the other night, but once again, my condolences to your sister. And I'm glad she was at peace when she passed. And uh, that's a blessing in itself. So uh, I think I can speak right. to the whole panel and all of our listeners. We're uh, sure are sorry for your loss. Okay. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, Commissioner. Um, so moving to uh, the town of Cornelius, uh, we're joined by Mayor Woody Washam. Uh, Mayor, the microphone's yours. John, I believe the mayor had another commitment. Oh, okay, I called great. Up. This is Wayne oh, Heron. I'm hey, Wayne. Yeah, from Mayor awesome. Yeah, and, very uh, good. Wayne, thanks for joining. Appreciate the opportunity. And, uh, yes, sir. And uh, I'm going to keep it very brief. Uh, in Cornelius, we are very excited about phase one beginning on Friday. We are working with our communication staff to develop messaging to ensure that our citizens understand how phase one impacts them. And we want to definitely support our small businesses and uh, let people understand that uh, how they can visit businesses safely and how they can go back to work safely. We are also beginning the planning of how we can uh, have public meetings again in phase two uh, and how we can have town board, uh, planning board and other community meetings. So we are beginning all that planning. We are doing messaging uh, and trying to get the word out. And uh, we want our citizens to be safe and how they go into phase one. Uh, so that concludes the report for Cornelius. 
Oh, wonderful, Wayne. Hey, and thanks for uh, pitching and hitting here for the mayor. So we appreciate you, sir. Yes, sir. You bet. Moving to town of Huntersville. Uh, mayor, are you with us today? I am, but you know what? You did do a great job of uh, recapping everything going on in the state and um, as well as uh, Mecklenburg County. And, you know, just like Cornelius, we're going through all the same uh, tasks of trying to figure out how to have our public meetings in the best uh, uh, light and also uh, under the current, uh, you know, more future phase one and then hopefully phase two shortly after that. Uh, you know, one thing I'll add in terms of, uh, you know, all the statistics that you hear and, one, and it's something that the state has been looking at and I think correctly, uh, the percentage uh, tests as a uh, positive test as a total of all tests uh, right now that's down to about six percent it was as high as 17 percent and even going back to when they really first started it was uh, about eight percent so there are more tests going on but fortunately uh, the percentage isn't uh, going up it's going down so that's that's a good sign that we're we're doing what we need to do um, so I will say that we are excited about phase one starting at five o'clock on uh, Friday and uh, we'll look forward to getting our businesses up and running as best they can. And I know it's still not going to be easy, but uh, any sense of normalcy and getting back to work will help all, all matters here, whether it be mental health or our overall health and then certainly our economic health. So I don't have anything really to add. We'll have, uh, uh, in terms of the town, we'll have a budget meeting next Monday and then a uh, public hearing on our budget on May 18th as on our normal town board meeting. And then we'll look forward to seeing what the numbers are around that time. And hopefully we can go into phase two fairly uh, quickly after the 22nd. So, Very that's good. All I have. Thank you, Mayor. Much appreciated, sir. Thank you for your leadership. And I mean that. Uh, Town of Davidson, uh, Commissioner Matthew Fort was unable to be with us today. He did uh, at least let me know there were no updates to report. Uh, I'm sure he would have echoed uh, Cornelius and uh, Huntersville sentiments as well. Uh, and then moving to uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Lake Norman Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Bill Russell, who's always first one on the call and is always patient and kind of closing us out here. So, uh, Mr. Russell, the microphone's yours. <laughs> Well, John, I want to go on record. I think Commissioner Cotham has a microphone buried somewhere within my office because many of the points <laughs> that she was raising, uh, I've, I've been talking about as well. Let me just first off say, uh, my heart goes out to Pat. Uh, I, did, I, did, I was unaware of her, her sister. And uh, as someone who, I lost my father, as you know, last year, and, yeah. and you, you don't really get over that. So again, um, my, my heart goes out to Pat Cotham. Uh, some of the concerns that she raised, the issues that he, she raised, uh, I'm, I'm kind of hearing some of the same things from some, some business owners. I don't think it's uh, prolific, but uh, some of the folks, uh, particularly lower wage employees, making more money right now than they were possibly making uh, when they're employed. And, and now that some of the businesses are starting back, you know, some are thinking, hey, I'll just stay here and collect these uh, benefits. <clears throat> and so we are concerned about people using the system in, in that manner. Uh, the other thing that she raised uh, is the stress, the absolute stress on the business owners and managers thinking, you know, being closed down for six, eight weeks, how am I going to get things going again? Um, we are actually having a program a week from this Friday, which is going to be our focus Friday, that is, uh, we have folks from Atrium and Novant that are going to be talking about the stress on those employees, on those employers, and also on the families themselves. Um, as Everyone in the call has mentioned, as the president of the Chamber of Commerce, I don't know that there's anyone more excited than us moving into phase one. Uh, that is fantastic news that uh, we already had some essential businesses that have been open throughout this pandemic. Uh, we had more coming online, and now we have even more coming online this coming uh, Friday. So we're very, very excited about that. We want to make sure we do so in a, a very safe manner. I know that there are people still uncomfortable uh, about going outside, and I certainly understand that, but we want to take precautions. Um, I think I shared last time out that May 4th through the 11th had been originally intended to be Small Business Week from the Small Business Administration, but because of the pandemic, the SBA has kicked that down the road. I don't know when they're going to be celebrating it, 
but we wanted to not celebrate so much as to honor small businesses this week and next week. And we have been doing a series of programs. Um, Pat brought up landlord issues and tenant issues. Yesterday, we had a program with Charles Knox Jr. with the Knox Group, and he talked about landlord and tenant relationships and best practices due to COVID-19. Uh, we recorded that, and we're going to be placing that on our website later today. So if you're a landlord or a tenant, it's some tremendous information. Dale Gilmore also spoke um, about the PPP, as, as well as my board chair, Richard Pappas, who is from First National Bank, and they talked about processing some of those loans. So some of that information is going to be on this special seminar that you can find on our chamber website. Um, opening for business. We have a blueprint for shopping safe that we put onto our website. That uh, document was actually created by two national retail associations about uh, safe practices as, long, uh, as well as a responsible reentry document. We're working right now on a guide that we're going to get out in the next couple of days. I hope to have it at least up by Friday on restarting Lake Norman. You will see the hashtag restart LKN. Uh, this document's going to be out there about how to operate your business, whether it's retail or small business or, or corporate, in a very safe manner. And it's going to be a very um, concise compendium of, of all the information that you'll need. Uh, we have a program today at 2 o'clock. We have a virtual uh, seminar on leading and managing through crisis. Karen Bentley, who is a former county commissioner for Mecklenburg County. She's going to be leading that discussion. That's going to be at two o'clock. It is open to all businesses, whether they're members of the Chamber of Commerce or not. Um, you can go to our Chamber website and get information at lakenormanchamber.org. Tomorrow, we're going to have a virtual business after hours. Uh, and then on Friday, we're going to have a program on Zoom. Many, many people who may be listening to this or watching it later on uh, are participants in the Zoom webinars but they may not know how to drive Zoom. This is, uh, as we're probably, when we're coming back from this and, and organizing our businesses, we're probably gonna see more virtual meetings and programs. And so you may wanna be more familiar with that particular uh, program. So again, that's gonna be taking place uh, this coming Friday. We're very excited. For seven years, we have had a small business luncheon where we've always had a nationally renowned speaker come in and speak. And we couldn't put that together because of the pandemic, but we have a program, a little inspiration, a touch of motivation, and a lot of laughs that's going to take place next week, May 11th, 12th, and 13th. That's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock each night. It's a program that we're putting together with WSIC and uh, Joe Vagnone, uh, who hosts Local Biz Now, and we have three nationally renowned speakers. We have Steve Gilliland, who is back from last year. He keynoted last year's event. Steve's going to be joining us on Wednesday. We have Chuck Gallagher, who was actually the keynote from two years ago. He's going to be back uh, talking about the distinctive advantage, and we got Kathy McAfee, um, who is a tremendous motivator, and she's going to be speaking on the fearless leader. So we've got that program coming up as well. Again, a lot of things on the Chamber website at lakenormanchamber.org, information about all of these events and programs. Um, John, i got to tell you, you know, we, we're an organization. We've been around for 33 years. We have 860 Chamber of Commerce members in Huntersville, Davidson, Cornelius, and spread throughout the greater Lake Norman region. We are very anxious to get these businesses back. Um, we had a tremendous economy. We had the lowest unemployment in the history of this country. We had all-time stock market high. We had an economy that was rolling, not only in the United States, but here at Lake Norman. We, we were the envy of, of the whole Charlotte region right here at the lake. We want to get back to that, and we want to make sure as a, as a chamber of commerce, we're giving our business owners and managers the tools they need, not only to have survived this pandemic, but thrive on the opposite side. So we want to make sure we're giving, giving those businesses the tools. We think many of them, uh, those resources are on our website at lakenormanchamber.org. But again, John, as I've said each and every time, I thank you for the initiative you know, when you called me, I think this has been going on for five, six weeks now. Seven, seven weeks. This is our seventh uh, week. Seven weeks. Yeah. Seven weeks, three times a week. Um, the, the, the amount of effort, I, as someone who organizes meetings 
at events and seminars. When you're trying to pull together, it's one thing pulling together a speaker for a program. When you're trying to line up 10 speakers or so on a single program, the, the amount of time and effort it goes into doing that. Uh, my hat's off to you. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for the resource that you're putting together for folks out there that they can go to this particular Zoom presentation, record it, look and hear the materials, hear the information. So thank you on behalf of the Lake Norman Chamber of Commerce and our members for what you're doing out there. Uh, you bet. And, uh, and thanks again for your continued leadership. And as a, as a business owner and a proud member of your chamber ever since I started my business, uh, you make me proud for what you're doing. So thank you very, very much, Bill. Um, and just as a reminder, it's also a Huntersville Regional Chamber. Uh, we've always had an open invite. Uh, and although no one's joined, I just want to make sure you know that's a resource out there available to you. Uh, and then visit Lake Norman. Um, our good executive, our good friend, Executive Director Sally Ashworth and her whole team. They have a virtual tip jar. They have a list of lakeside curb, curbside listings for, for uh, food and delivery services. And then you can actually get a really a cool Zoom background. They have lots of photos of Lake, the Lake Norman area that you can just download them, save them, and make them a Zoom background. So uh, go to visit lakenorman.org and you can navigate your way to any of those uh, resources there. And the virtual tip jar is really neat as well to help somebody uh, while we're you know, basically not able to go into restaurants. Uh, I want to just thank all my panelists. Uh, couldn't do this without you. Uh, our next briefing will be Friday, May the 8th. Uh, please keep your emails coming in. Today was a longer call than usual, but just really important information. Send an email to lkntogether at gmail.com. Uh, you know, this, this call is not about politics. It never has been. We have uh, Democrats, Republicans. We've had all kinds of folks on this call, um, and uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, but we are stronger together. I hope you take care of yourself, take care of each other. You can find these posted to Elect Bradford. It's on Facebook, Elect Bradford. And uh, I also tweet them, uh, which is uh, John Ray Bradford. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can get it there. Uh, but uh, thanks for listening. This does conclude today's call.